this is Duke University. OSCOMP Systems was formed around an innovative compression technology that allows you to have liquids and gas and move them through a single pipeline. So typically when you produce oil and gas in, at the wellhead, they come in together on a single well bore. And at that point you have to separate them. So you typically store the oil in tanks and you separate the water from it as well and then the gas is compressed and moved through a pipeline. Well that tankage and storage aside from being a loss of efficiency, you also have a lot of environmental impact there from uh, volatile organic content that actually uh, evaporates and has a huge effect on the environment. Uh, regulation is changing and, and part of what our technology allows you to do is that line that you are using only for gas, our compressor can actually do liquids as well as gas. So you're able to move them both in a single pipeline and then never have a problem of fugitive emissions. A lot of the easy oil has already been found and been produced. And in order to satisfy the demands of a growing world, because same as you drive your car in the US, everybody in China, everybody in India would also like to have the same standard of living, that's going to require a lot of energy. And getting to this oil requires that's a lot harder. It may be trapped in very difficult rock. And that's essentially how hydraulic fracturing got to be play in the mix. It may be immobile oil because it's very heavy, so that's tar sands and a lot of other types of oil. Now you have to really use technology in order to get to that oil. And it's a fascinating opportunity when you think that in the United States, between only three states, the oil shale, which is a fairly different uh, than what you typically hear, Bakken and Eagleford, these are all tight oil formations, but oil shales, specifically in Colorado, and uh, Wyoming uh, and Utah, you have over a trillion barrels of recoverable oil that's trapped in that resource. And that's pretty unique where the United States has, is not only the Saudi Arabia, the United States is the Middle East in a single country for that resource. And technology in order to get that productive and cost effective isn't there yet. So there's a huge opportunity. And that's just one example. Energy traditionally and until the early 2000s had always had a small amount of, of early stage technology investment. You didn't see very large investments. With the uh, clean tech revolution, you had a lot of funds that were before directed towards uh, information technology and the web and mobile and a lot of other technology applications. Then a lot of those funds started turning towards energy looking at the potential to, uh, to create an impact and create attractive returns. So not only an impact on the environment, but also a great business proposition. So the amount of investment that went into the industry got increased dramatically. And now what we're seeing is that it's trending back to its original amount that was primarily at that time sustained by the oil and gas industry. So what you're seeing now, however, is because the oil is harder and harder to find, the investment going into technology is rising. So when you look at the amount of venture capital that exists right now, there's a lot of capital that's targeted towards improving either the economic, direct economics of extracting oil and gas, improving the environmental footprint, because in oil and gas you need a, a, a social license as well. So if you're not accepted by the public, you're in deep trouble. You cannot extract your resource. So there's a lot of opportunity there and crossover. So the way I look at it, there's a lot of opportunities in clean energy that if you use oil and gas as your stepping stone, you have a way to build a foundation under your business that then you continue growing and develop a lot of markets that standalone may not have the uh, capital available for you to scale it otherwise. Oil and gas is a very broad space and anywhere you look, I mean, it's, it's fully driven by technology. So if you think of other areas that have developed very quickly and big data, for example, looking at a lot of other issues. But when you apply it to oil and gas, you have so much data that over the course of the last 100 plus years has been gathered, seismic data, 
um, data that now you have imaging capabilities that did not exist even 20 years ago. So now you have abilities to be able to see or understand what's going down, what's happening 20,000 feet under the ground. Um, and those capabilities, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for big data in general. Um, not only that, but when you think of all of, of the impact of just digital everything in the oil field, a lot of things are mechanical and analog in nature. So if you start to automate, if you start to understand how to optimize, um, there's a lot of productivity gains that can be done, that can be obtained by uh, applying information technology in a different way. Um, there's also very big targets. So if you think of where are the areas of the world that have been underexplored, you think of very cold regions. So the, uh, the Arctic in particular has been discussed. But the Arctic offers unique challenges. It's a very environmentally sensitive environment. So you have to, you have to be very careful because the effects of a spill the response time that you have in the Gulf of Mexico is very different than when you have in Alaska. And the resources available are very different as well. So you have to do a lot of this planning up front, have a lot of technology that can operate in very harsh environments with critical sub-zero temperatures. Minus 70 is not an uncommon temperature in the North Slope. So it requires a very different approach from a material science perspective. Hopefully also suitable for other applications um, and, and other industries. I think a good entrepreneur needs to be able to deal with failure, uh, even small failure. Even when you're successful, you have a lot of small failures along the way. And you have to be able to deal with rejection a lot. Um, to bring an example uh, relevant to my, my own company, we were turned away by over 30 VCs. Uh, we actually ran out of which VCs we could, we could target to fundraise, and we eventually got a term sheet. Um, and we were two days away from running completely out of cash and having to let everybody go and having to abandon the project. So I was already in f completely in, uh, tapped out from a personal debt perspective. So being able to deal with, uh, with a lot of rejection and just picking yourself up and going at the same intensity and not only that, learning from that rejection and, and really growing from the experience, that's a critical factor. Uh, the other piece is being able to at the same time following your passion but not be blind by following your passion. You also need to take a step back and take a business lens to the problem, take a science lens and make sure that you're not trying to defy a problem simply because you, you're putting your heart into it in order to solve it. Maybe you need to take a step back and really look, look at the bigger picture uh, in how you address that. And, and that takes, I mean, shifting from a detail-oriented to a more global view is, uh, is a very difficult skill. Um, I do believe that entrepreneurship can be uh, taught, learned, and you can grow to be an entrepreneur if, uh, if you train and, and receive the education for it.